The text that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning is directed to Timothy as a pastor and directed to pastors. And I would share with you, as I share with you this morning, I would mention that if I um, was speaking to a different audience, if I was speaking to an audience of seminary students or of young men that were considering whether or not God might be leading them toward the ministry, I'd have a very different message. However, the passage is very much focused upon those that are in ministry, those that are involved with ministry. And the passage we're looking at this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16. And as we look at the passage this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you and pointing out that even though the passage is pointed to Timothy, as it says right off at the beginning, and pointing out these things to the brethren, um, you'll be a good servant of Christ. And down in verse 11, he says, prescribe and teach these things. Even as it says that, I want to point out that you're not off the hook. It's not just talking to the pastors. Because if you look at verse 12, verse 12 says, let no one look down on your youthfulness or despise your youthfulness. In other words, don't anyone minimize what you have to say because of your youth, Timothy. And that command, instruction there, is not exactly something that you can expect. Think of Timothy as a young pastor there in Ephesus. It's not like as a young pastor, I don't know how old he was, but it's not like he can say and that he can stand in front of the congregation in Ephesus and say, now don't you be mad at me because I'm a youngster, or don't you get, you just, you can't imagine that. But as Paul wrote this, it was to give instruction indirectly to the congregation, to the congregation, don't you look down on Timothy just because of his youth. The point here is that it's not just for pastors, that it's intended to be read and understood by the rest of the congregation there. Now, before we spend a lot of time here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 this morning, I actually am going to be looking at a couple other passages. So I'm just going to tell you what my plan is today so that at least you can have visual uh, mile markers by the side of the road as we go down the road. You know, if you're going across the state, and it's one of these states that has all the exits based upon the mile marker, you know what exit you get off at, and as you mark, knock off the mile markers, you know you're getting closer and closer. Well, I'm going to tell you what the mile markers are, so that at least as we go forward this morning, you can say, oh, okay, we made it that far. Okay, we made it that far, just so you know where we're going. What I'm going to be doing this morning is first I'm going to share two other passages with you as a background. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12 and in Ephesians 4 just for background. We're going to look at those first. And then after that, we're going to come back here to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look first at verses 11 through 16, which is the second half of our text. We're going to look at that first. Now, that might sound odd to you, but the reason I'm doing that is because after that, we'll look at verses 6 through 10. And verses 6 through 10, I think, will more naturally lead into us observing the Lord's Supper, which is what we're going to be doing later on. So that's why I'm splitting it up a little bit. That's part of the reason why I'm splitting it and going in reverse order, just so that you don't think that when I start in verse 11, that I totally forgot the first half of the text. That's not, I didn't forget it. This is intentional, so you know. Now, the passages I want us to look at first, the background to this, I'd like to start with 1 Corinthians 12. So if you would please turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we look at this passage, we're, I'm pointing out, I want to call attention to the fact that Paul is writing, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 12, Paul makes the point that God gives a spiritual gift to everyone. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind, even as we look at 1 Timothy. In other words, Paul's talking to Timothy, saying, Timothy, you've got your spiritual gift, but it's only in the context of the church in Ephesus, and that everyone in the church has been given specific gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Uh, Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. 
There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now that verse 7 is very important. What God is saying through Paul is that each person that's a believer in the church, the church, Paul refers to believers in the church as saints. The saints are not just those that some hierarchy says, oh, these are special saints. Instead, Paul refers to all believers as saints. And the saints are given to each one a gift, a manifestation, an outworking. So just think about this for a minute this morning, that as it applies to you, God has given you, with whoever you are, whatever your background, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, God enabled you in some way by his Holy Spirit, in some way with something to benefit the whole church. That's verse 7. It says, it's given for the common good or to, for the profit with all, I believe is how King James has it. But the, the idea is that this is for others' benefit. In other words, it's not just something that is for your own pet use or something that you benefit from or something that is to be privately kept by you, but God's purpose in giving you the gift of the Holy, a, a gift through the Holy Spirit is for you to then minister to other people. Now, Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 12, I'm not going to take the time, in verses 8 through and following, he gives an example of a number of different types of gift, whether it's prophecy or teaching um, or different things that are given out. He uses those, gives those examples there. The point here in 1 Corinthians 12 is that God gives different people different types of gifts for the benefit of the church as a whole. Now I'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verses 11 through 16. I'm not going to read all those verses, but verses 11 to 16. In these verses, Paul t talks about how God has chosen to give a gift to each church or giving gifts to the church. Specifically, the gifts to the church are those that have these specific gifts in verse 11. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul writes, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now, for me, as a pastor, this is a verse that means a lot to me. It gives direction to me in terms of what is God's purpose and will for me for my life. And he goes on in the next verse and explains what these that fill these roles are to do. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service or ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ. And so in verse 12, Paul says the reason for the pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the uh, prophets, for them to be given is for the building up or the edifying, the equipping of the church for the ministry. There, there is a misconception, I believe, in different circles. Maybe you've held it yourself sometime that the pastor's job or the teacher's job is to do the work of the ministry. Well, that's not quite right. The verse 12 is saying that the pastors and teachers are to be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. The ministry is to be continued and carried on by all of us in the church, by all believers. Going back to 1 Corinthians 12, that's why God gave gift to every person to profit with all, so they'll all benefit from it. So the ministry is to be done by all of us in the church, in the setting. Specifically, pastors, teachers, responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And it talks about how we look toward maturity. We're not tossed about by every wind of doctrine in the intervening verses. But then we come down to verse 16. And verse 16 speaks about how all the different parts of the body work together, like the different parts of a house as it's constructed, like the different parts of a human body and other metaphors. Uh, it's the, the, the joints, the head, the ear, the foot, whatever it is. Each one has a part. And verse 16 says, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so the background picture here for God that God has is that God gives a gift to each believer. God's given you a gift as a Christian, as a child of his, 
to be exercised in the context of the church for the benefit of the whole church and that each joint supplies and works with that. And I think that this is a helpful background to keep in mind as we go back to 1 Timothy. Just the fact that each of us have different spiritual gifts for the benefit of the church, profit of the church as a whole. So let's go back now to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll look at these verses beginning with verse 11. As we look at these verses, I'm, I'm going to be going just sort of sequentially through these. When you look at these verses from the whole text, from verse 6 down through verse 16, there are at least a dozen different commands that Paul gives Timothy. I mean, it's jing, 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 jing. I mean, it's one right after another, verse after verse. You just go through those, and it's like you definitely get the impression, almost like a machine gun, in terms of what Paul's saying to Timothy, saying this, 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 all the way down through. So we're coming in the middle of this with verse 11. I want you to, uh, to point something out that's interesting here. Notice the word, verse 11, the phrase, these things. Verse 11 says, prescribe and teach these things. That's a phrase that shows up several places. If you go back to verse 6, verse 6 says, and pointing out these things. So Paul is saying to Timothy, these things I'm telling you and talking about here are important. Timothy, stay focused on these things. Prescribe and teach these things. And if you go down to verse 15, you find it up again. Uh, verse 16, I'm sorry. Um, Pay attention to yourself and your... No, it's verse 15. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress may be evident to all. So Paul is making a point for Timothy. Timothy, this is where the focus, the focus of your life is to be on these things, Timothy. Pour yourself into it, Timothy. It's what I'm teaching. So two weeks ago when I was preaching on the first part of chapter 4, that talked about don't listen to all the false teachers, the Holy Spirit said that false teachers are going to arise in the church. And Paul says, make sure that you deal with that, address that. And in pointing out these things, verse 6, you'll be a good servant of Christ. So these things, whatever these things are that Paul's talking about, are very important. Timothy is being told by Paul, pay attention to these things. Now I want you to think, look at the specific imperatives, the commands in verse 11. Paul says, prescribe and teach these things. The Greek word that is translated there as prescribe, it has the idea of commanding, announcing. Paul is saying to Timothy, you command and teach these things with authority. Prescribe and teach. And give instruction. But then it's very interesting, looking right after that, verse 12 says, and let no one look down on your youthfulness. Now, look at verse 11 and 12 together and think about this. Paul is telling the young man, Timothy, who apparently is not very old or mature, you know, in terms of his chronological age. He's not as chronologically gifted as many of us are. Uh, he's looking at Timothy and saying, Timothy, you speak this with authority. You command and teach these things. Now, how does that come across to you? Because, typically, don't we sometimes grate a little bit when a younger person tells us something that we ought to know or hear? We tend to take something from a peer or from someone older than us or someone definitely more experienced than us. We tend to take that as that they've been down the ropes, they've, they've earned where they come from. I'll listen to them because they have experience behind them. But you let some youngster that's still wet behind the ears start telling yourself, even if it's true. Have you noticed, by the way, I can say this to us here in the audience, have you ever noticed that doctors are getting younger and younger? <laughs> you know, you look at, you go to your doctor sometime and you think, hmm, I guess he's probably graduated from high school. <laughs> you know, you look at them and you sometimes, and yet they're the ones that are telling us what we need to do physically, whatever it is. And it's just, it's a little bit different. T Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, in verse 11, you command this with authority. In verse 12, he says, and will anyone look down at you because of how old you are? Look at how those two verses go together. 
I mean, naturally, especially in some cultures, those who are advanced in age are esteemed and looked up to. And here Paul is, is saying to Timothy that you need to command and teach with authority these things that you're communicating. And he's saying it over and over again, these things, these things, these things. This is how you need to communicate it. So I'm sharing these two verses to get started here from the perspective that Paul is saying to Timothy that you need to speak and, and say these, and he's speaking to the church indirectly, saying, don't let anyone look down at you because of your youth. I'd like to extend that a little bit further from the standpoint that there could be other reasons why a pastor or teacher could have something in his background that could cause the congregation or audience to just have a, just irks me that he has this mannerism, this quality, this trait, this characteristic. I'd like to suggest that as the congregation is being spoken to by Paul, that when Timothy speaks to the congregation at Ephesus, thus says the word of God, and he speaks biblical truth, that no matter what his mannerisms, or age, or where he came from, or anything else, should take away from that. What Paul's essentially saying is that you have the authority of the word of God. You're supposed to give yourself to this completely. And so when you proclaim, when you speak the word of God, your congregation is to listen and hear and adhere to it. Now, I have been here as the pastor for about 25 years. And so you have known me for a long, long time. My kids have grown up here. And so I've been here for a long, long time. However, there could come a time when I'm not going to be the pastor anymore. We've been told before, I was been, I've been mentioned before, that every pastor should recognize that he is an interim pastor. Because by God's grace, all of us are there for just an interim period of time. I have no clue. I have no plans. Nothing specific right now. However, I just need to say that this passage is important for us as a congregation for you as an individual, no matter where God directs your steps, whether you live in Cortland for the rest of your life, or you, like everyone else in the world, move to Florida. <laughs> um, wherever you are, we need to look at what God's word is saying right here and consider what does the man of God, no matter his mannerisms, experience, his age, or whatever, if he's speaking the biblical truth, which Paul says to Timothy, give yourself to this, we need to consider and not take away from that truth that's given and shared. And I believe that verses 11 and 12 speak to that very well. Verse 13, Paul then goes on, until I come, give attention to, and he mentions three things. And you'll notice that some of the words are italicized in your Bible, depending on your translation and what it is. The words are, trans are italicized because the translators have had to supply them to try to fill in where there are not corresponding Greek words in the original letter. And so one of these words that is given is reading, give attention to reading. And our translators have helped us out sometimes to the reading of scripture, that's what Paul is likely meaning here, to the reading, but then he goes on after that and says to reading, and then uh, verse exhortation and teaching, reading, exhortation, and teaching. Now we understand the importance of all three of those. Think about a church setting. If you were to go to a church and they didn't have the reading of Scripture, the exhortation from Scripture and teaching regarding Scripture, you could go away from a service and think, you know, there's something missing there. Now, admittedly, if it's a service that's dedicated for worship or some other purpose or praise at a time, then, you know, you could, you could give an excuse, you could understand that sort of a thing. But if a church in its normal routine, how it conducted things, did not have a place for the reading of Scripture and for exhortation and teaching, you would have rightly a reason to draw back and question whether or not that is a place where the Word of God is being communicated and handled correctly. I'd like to consider also how we look at those three words, the idea of reading and exhortation and teaching. We are all conditioned and influenced by what we've personally experienced. You and I, we all have ways of looking at that. If you look back at the colonial days and how they did church back then, you'd find that it would be very different from how we do church today. For one thing, our sermons, including mine, are much shorter than what theirs were back at that time. 
they would have long ones. You go to other parts of the country, and I've heard this before, that in some of the uh, southern churches and some particular circles down there, that if the, pa if the sermon's not at least an hour or, or longer, then people feel like they're being shortchanged, that they're not really getting what they really should, and that it needs to be, it has to be longer than that. Now, I'm not saying there's anything right or wrong with that, but it's what we're accustomed to. We're used to church, and for years we've looked at evangelical churches as having their list of services as being Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and that's pretty much what you would expect from many evangelical churches, particularly in the 60s, me, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and even the early 2000s, you'd expect that. Things have shifted and changed within many circles, so things are not quite the same now in terms of how churches are conducting things. But that doesn't mean that it was right back then and it's wrong today. Or if you want to go back far enough, how about going back to the colonial days where the sermon could be a couple hours long? Is that the right way? I mean, which is the right way? Another perspective, too, is every example I've given you is a service in the context of the whole body coming together. But I'd like to suggest that we open that up a little bit wider than that and consider that sometimes it's very necessary for exhortation and teaching and scripture to be on a more personal level, on a more private level. Robert Baxter was a Puritan pastor in Kinder Kinderminster, England in the 1600s, 17th century, and he wrote a book called The Reformed Pastor. It has nothing to do with the reformed, um, reformed position as is typically thought of today, but he used the word reformed in terms of a pastor who was thinking one way and then got reformed in his thinking. He was a teacher and he's very controversial, but one of the things that he taught in his book in the Reformed Pastor is that he says that in order for you to be a faithful man of God, you need to be out there in your local community, going from house to house, teaching and instructing each home and catechizing each of the different homes and heads of family. Now, that was a different world back in the 17th century, 1600s. That was a different church situation, as opposed to our American experience of separation of church and state. This was very much back in the English system with the Church of England and having authority over all sorts of affairs down there to the smallest level. But one of the points that Baxter made is that unless you are actually in the homes, you can't be knowing what's happening in the life of each home. And he says, unless you're teaching the fathers how to teach their children and give them example, unless you're catechizing and that you're teaching them questions questions and answers from the Word of God, you're not fulfilling your ministerial duty. And that was a big point that Baxter made at that particular time. Now separate that, if you will, and contrast that to today. Baxter was saying you've got to be in homes teaching and communicating. He was a different culture, different setting, different whole world back then in the 1600s from us today. We look at church as being right and these things being fulfilled if we show up on Sunday morning and if we hear the sermon on Sunday morning, or if we have Sunday school, if we did that, or if we have prayer meeting, or whatever it is. But totally different from Baxter's perspective back in the 1600s. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that we go back to the 1600s, but I am suggesting that we consider that for exhortation and teaching, there could be more involved to help believers to mature to maturity, which is the goal of Ephesians chapter 4, looking under Christ than just the public services that we have. Let me give you an example. All of you have to go for your physicals with your doctor. We all have a physical at least once a year. Some people take pride in the fact, I haven't been there in 15 years. And then they go and all of a sudden they find out a bunch of things that they should have been taking care of that they haven't. Regardless of that and your background story, that doesn't matter so much. However, Think about when you go to the doctor for your physical. Usually the first thing is a nurse will have to take your temperature and your blood pressure. They'll usually weigh you on a scale. They also measure you to see how tall you are. That always struck me as odd. You know, we don't change that much in our height. But I remember going to the doctor down here in Dryden when I was going to him, and every single physical, they have to me measure you again. Like, 
I don't shrink, I don't grow that much anymore, but I have shrunk a little bit. But I mean, that's, why do they measure that? But they always think, on the scale, measure your height, take your blood pressure, take your temperature, and then the doctor comes in after you get in there in the waiting, in the uh, exam room, I mean, not the waiting room. And what does the doctor do? Almost always, one of the first things he does, he wants to get his stethoscope out, wants to check your lungs and your heart. I mean, that's, those are the first things that, first things always happen. Two or three plates on your back, on your chest, you know, check your pulse, all that stuff. And all that is just the background. And that's the beginning of your physical. Now, unless you walk in and you're limping, or you have a rash, or you're coughing, or you're blowing your nose, if you have any other symptoms, the doctor can't tell, unless you tell him. Because the doctor can only see what those initial survey things, background information, temperature, blood pressure, all that stuff, wants to find out that, he can see that. And the nurse can see that, and they can check that. But if you have a pain in your side that won't go away, if you've got something in a part of your body that acts up, or headaches, or neck, or chest, if you don't tell the doctor, the doctor doesn't know. And you can go through your annual physical year after year with symptoms inside you that you never tell your doctor about. And he doesn't help you. He can't help you. He doesn't look into them and give more tests. He doesn't have any other blood work done, any other x-rays, any other scans done. He doesn't do it because he doesn't know there's any problem there. Unless there's a problem, the doctor can't help you. And so a person can go to their doctor for year after year, and as long as their blood pressure's okay, their temperature's okay, as long as their lungs sound clear, they can get a good bill of health and then to the doctor's office. However, inside, they could have cancer, they could have other symptoms, other issues, that they never tell the doctor about the symptoms. Now let's take that doctor illustration and bring it back to what Paul is saying here about these three things, to reading, to exhortation, and to teaching. Is that if the pastor's responsibility, young Timothy's responsibility, is to be an example um, of the believers, and he's supposed to pay attention to reading of scripture, exhortation, and teaching, I would suggest to you that Timothy is going to be disadvantaged to whatever extent the church in Ephesus and the individuals in the church don't communicate to Timothy what's going on in their lives. Just think about it. Timothy's given the job to equip saints. Timothy's given the job to preach, to command, to teach, to give himself completely to this. And yet the believers in Ephesus don't say, Timothy, I'm wrestling with this. Timothy, I'm having a challenge or something over here. It's like the person going to the doctor and having all the symptoms and feeling awful on the inside at times, but doesn't say a word to the doctor when he's there for the physical. There's a parallel here I think it's appropriate to consider. And it's appropriate for us to consider in that all of us are part of the church of God, and God has given us different gifts. And Paul says to Timothy, this is your gift. This is where you're to exercise it in these particular areas. So going back to verse 12, Paul says, you are to be an example. And as he says you're to be an example, you're to be an example in speech. Look at these five things that Paul mentions. How to be an example in these five areas round out Timothy's life experience as a person. Think about this for yourself, your speech, everything that you say that people happen to hear. Not just publicly when you're at work, or at the church, but in your home. Paul says you're to be an example in your speech, Timothy. And then secondly, in your conduct. In terms of how you live and conduct and live as a person, Timothy, there in Ephesus, what do people see, what do they know about you? In terms of your conduct when you're with other people, in terms of your uh, anger, in terms of your control, in terms of your, your love that you have, that's the next one he mentions, your love. But then in terms of his theology and doctrine, you're to be an example in terms of your faith, your confidence and trust in God. You're to set an example before people that are older than you, Timothy, in terms of having faith and confidence and trust in God. 
And fifthly, you're also to be an example and the purity of your life, moral cleanliness, in terms of how you conduct yourself, in terms of going back to what he had said earlier, being blameless. Paul's saying, Timothy, these five are where you're to be an example for believers in that regard. I, I don't think Paul was expecting Timothy to be perfect. He couldn't have been. Every one of us is a fallen creature, and every pastor, no matter who, where, no matter how highly esteemed or how big the church, or no matter how much of a mystic he is, or how much of a student and a scholar he is, or how much of a people person he is, all of us are sinful and all will fall. But Paul says, Timothy, you're to strive to be an example in these different areas. And then he goes on, and he says after these, these things, he then speaks in verses 14 through the rest of 16 about, Timothy, pour yourself into this. This is where your focus, so your energy, your life, all of it should be poured into this. In other words, this Timothy is where you are supposed to be investing yourself. Verse 14. Don't neglect the spiritual gift within you. By the way, here that ties back to 1 Corinthians 12. Spiritual gift given to everyone to profit with all. Paul's calling attention to it. Don't neglect that spiritual gift which is given you, which was bestowed on you, the prophetic utterance, the laying on of hands by the presbytery. And as the presbytery refers to those that are the elders, and for those of you that have ever been to an ordination ceremony before, this is typically when those that have a, those pastors and elders that have examined the candidate at the end of that service when he has, uh, he has passed their review, the questioning, he, they, he's been examined in terms of all these different things, then at the end of that ordination ceremony, then those elders that are present, pastors that are there, put their hand on the candidate to pray for him committing him to the Lord for the future ministry in his life. And I don't know how they did in the first century, but that's how we do it today. And we're trying to follow the pattern that we see here, but I believe that's what Paul's talking about, the laying on of hands of the presbytery. But then again, notice the focus of, of life. Paul says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in these things so that your progress will be evident to all. In other words, Paul's saying to Timothy, you choose to make choices that show to other people that you're trying to apply yourself to grow in these different areas. Show that you're doing something here to try to grow in advance. I would say today that for different men, for their background, their, how they're wired, what they're like is going to show different, different ways. I can imagine that for some pastors, that for them to be able to apply themselves, that for them to be exposed to um, some types of meetings or whatever it is, that could be very, very helpful, or conferences. Um, for me personally, the way I'm wired, when I was here as a young pastor, um, I did go to some different conferences, and they're great. They're a helpful shot in the arm. I enjoyed those, and they're beneficial, and I still could benefit from going to those, that sort of a thing. I did, however, find, though, a number of years ago, probably like 20 years or so ago, Boy, it's, it makes me feel old, but 20-some uh, years ago, I discovered that they were a great shot in the arm for me personally, but I felt that they didn't have a long continuing benefit long after the actual event. So like they were really helpful and encouraging, but it didn't have a long-lasting value, I felt, in terms of my own life and ministry. Now, I don't want to take away from them because they're still beneficial and helpful, and it could be different than other people. What I personally found, though, is that as I took Doctor of Ministry classes, where I had to focus and pour myself into a particular class that I was taking, that that was beneficial for me in a much longer impact and effect on my life. And that's why I began taking the classes way back many, many years ago, one of them. My desire at that time was I wanted to stay sharp. I didn't want to get dull. I wanted to stay sharp and be challenged. And that was a way that, to me, it appealed to me. But that's the way I'm wired. And I'm just giving this as my personal example. But the point here that Paul is saying, take pains with these things. Be absorbed so that your progress will be evident to all. And I would suggest that other pastors have different things that could be helpful for them. And every congregation ought to encourage their respective pastor to do those things that are helpful for him to grow in terms of the ministry. That's where I'm going with this that each congregation should do that. Paul says, pay close attention to yourself and your teaching. Persevere in these things, 
For as you do this, you'll ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So Paul is basically saying, verses 14 through 16, pour yourself into it, Timothy. It'll benefit you personally, and in turn, the congregation will benefit as well. I'm going to speak to some of these different things again at the very end to talk about some practical sides of things. But at this point, I'd now like to jump back up to the first half. We finished verses 11 through 16, and I'd now like to go back to verses 6 through 10. And I'm taking this last because of how it leads into the Lord's Supper, I believe. In verses 6 through 10, Paul starts verse 6 with the same comment about these things and pointing out these things to the brethren. You'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished in the words of faith and sound doctrine, which you've been following. I want to point out that down in verses 14, 15, and 16, Paul is constantly telling Timothy, pay attention to your teaching, pay attention to sound doctrine, pay attention to what is appropriate, the orthodox teaching of the Word of God, pay attention. And he's saying that repeatedly throughout this whole passage. In other words, it's to be a priority in the life of a pastor to make sure that what he is teaching is the Word of God that is correctly interpreted and understood. When I was going through seminary, I'd finished up grad school, I'd passed in Massachusetts, I'd gone back to seminary, and I was taking a class, doc, uh, I was taking a class, Dr. Lovick was the, was the professor, and uh, Lovick was teaching a class in hermeneutics. And he said, and this is one of my first classes going back to school, he says, Man, he says, you'll never um, tire of getting more books on this particular topic. Now, as I'd already pastored before, I'd already, I already had a master's degree. Oh, okay. Um, and I thought, oh, I guess this is my first class I've taken back here. I bet every professor is probably going to say that. I bet every class every professor teaches is going to say about his favorite class, this is the one that you want to invest your life in. I just expected that. However, in looking back now, I believe Lovick was right. <laughs> and hermeneutics, the correct interpretation of the Word of God, to me, I think, continues to be one of the most important things for a pastor to look at. Because if you misinterpret the Word of God, you mislead the people of God. You have to interpret and understand it correctly. And so when Paul puts all this emphasis on being nourished in the words of faith and sound doctrine, Paul's putting an emphasis here where it needs to be for the sake of the church. And I would say that if a pastor is careless in his handling of the word of God, I would be very, very skeptical and scary about anything he might say because you never know when. He's going to be slipping up if he's not conscientious in the area of hermeneutics. It's essential to be able to, you might guess there's a little bit of conviction coming out, but it's essential to be able to think correctly, not make logical fallacies and improper jumps in the interpretation of the Word of God. Uh, D.A. Carson has a book entitled Ex Exegetical Fallacies, which I think is fantastic. He lists a whole bunch of different places where people wrongly reach, reach conclusions wrongly about the Word of God. And I believe we have to be very, very careful on that. And Timothy is being told by Paul, watch out, watch out, watch out, over and over again. And from my experience now, going back all these years, I've seen again and again where people make errors in terms of conclusions they reach wrong conclusions because they've not carefully considered the Word of God. We've got to look at the Word of God correctly. So that's interpretation. Now we'll go back here, continuing on. But the emphasis is that you've got, to be, you've got to be looking at the Word of God correctly. In verse 7 now, Paul referencing the fact that there's false teachers all around have nothing to do with the worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And this is what I wanted to have as the beginning of our close, my closing remarks. Because in, the closing, in my closing remarks, focusing on these verses, these are verses that not only apply to Timothy as a young pastor, but you 
as a child of God. Look at what Paul's saying here in verse 7, in verse 8, verse 7. <coughs> End of verse 7. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Timothy was a young man. Those of us that were young men once. Just knocked out half of you guys, ladies. Those of us that were one young men once. We might have tried to pride ourselves in our physique in different settings or situations, standing up straight, holding our chest up, uh, exercising, toning our, we might have tried to do all those things at certain points in our young lives as young men. We might have. Timothy's a young man. There's a lot of stuff that goes with that. Is it good stewardship of the body? It can be. Is it sometimes motivated by pride? Uh, I suppose it probably could a ton of the time. But Paul is saying to Timothy, a young man, Timothy, don't exercise, you know, bodily exercise profits little. Exercise yourself, pour yourself into godliness. And what Paul is saying here is that when you do that, Timothy, you're making an investment not just in this life. It's, you're going you're gonna to outgrow your young, youthful, young man body sometime. There might be a couple of us that could imagine that and think about that. Someday you'll outgrow that young man body. But someday you're going to outgrow that body completely. And God's going to take you home. And at that point, you'll realize the investment you've made in godliness will have been worth every bit of it. So Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, this is where you've got to put the energy in your life. Put the energy, the focus here into exercising yourself rather into godliness. And that applies to us. No matter whatever other things we might physically be worried about or considering in our own bodies and lives now, exercise yourself toward godliness, God-likeness. In other words, that which makes you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, God's purpose is that he would transform and conform you to the image of his Son. That's what God wants for you is to become more Christ-like. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, this is where your focus needs to be. Exercise yourself in a God-likeness. That's profitable for all things. Hold in the promise of the present life and also for the life to come. In other words, what you choose, Timothy, and what you choose as a child of God, not even a pastor, what you choose to invest in godliness in your life will have benefits. You're going to get interest. You make it, you make a, if you make a deposit in the bank or an investment account or whatever it might happen to be, or buy a CD, you do it because you expect to get some kind of a return from it. And hopefully it's better than 0.02% interest on your, on your savings deposit. Hopefully it's better than that. But the point Paul's saying is that, look, what you invest in godliness has returns in this life and the life to come. In other words, that's a good investment. It's got a long ROI, return on investment. You have, you're going to return the benefit. And I, I wanted to emphasize this here partly in leading to the closing because it's applicable for our lives today. But Paul then goes on and explains the reason for that. He says, um, it's the promise of the life to come. Verse 9, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. This is almost like Paul is saying in here, I'm going to clap my hands, not to startle you, but wake up, Timothy. This is profitable for all. He's saying this is a profitable, worthwhile, trustworthy statement, worthy of full acceptance. Now, some people have taken verse 9 to refer back to verse 8, but it can also refer ahead to the next verse, verse 10. Paul could be saying, this is true, Timothy. This is a trustworthy statement. This is what we pour our lives into. Verse 10, for this is what we labor and strive for, that we have our, fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. And I would suggest that verse 9 points ahead to verse 10. Is godliness good? Yes. 
but it's a hope. And all of what Paul's been saying in this whole passage is, Timothy, pour yourself into it. Invest your life, T Timothy. Put yourself, discipline yourself in this direction. Give yourself whole, wholly to this. Make pains to go into it. Let it be visible to other people. This is where you're investing your life. This is the whole thrust of it. And so I think verse 10 is where it all comes back to. Verse 10 says, this is our hope. We hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men. And for you as a child of God, or as a, if anyone else is listening and watching later with the video, anyone that's a potential pastor or pastor, yes, this is what we labor for. It's what we as pastors labor for. It's what you as a child of God live for. Your hope is in the living God. And it's real and it's true. And it's not true that there are a bunch of different paths that lead up the mountain and any of them will get you to God. That's not true. There's so many logical fallacies in that. That's a whole other story. And that's going through my head earlier when we were talking about this. However, Christ is the only way, truth, and the life. You know that. And when you put your hope and trust in him, as you live for him today, as you choose to make choices to prioritize him in all aspects, every aspect of your life, nothing hidden, nothing kept back, as you do that, you have a hope in the living God and Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Christ died for all, that all could put their faith and trust in him and all could be saved. Whoever puts his or her faith and trust in Jesus Christ shall be saved. All who call upon me, Christ said, all who call on me, I will deliver them, I will save them. It's only made effectual, though, for those whose hearts are yielded to Christ, acknowledging Christ as their Savior. And so we see in that last phrase, he is the Savior of all men, especially the believers. It is those that put their faith and trust in him, which is the reason why your unsaved granddaughter or cousin or sibling or neighbor or coworker needs Christ because Christ is the living God. He is the only hope, the savior of all men, but only effective for those who believe. In a few minutes, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper, and I think it's appropriate finishing here, looking at that, as we celebrate what we have together in common in Christ and in Christ alone. It's only because of what Christ has done. But our hope is in a living God. He's not in some uh, deity or idol or image that was carved by man out of wood and gilded with gold or silver or cast in gold and silver and is just lifeless that, has, that cannot think or breathe or talk or walk or think or do anything like that. But instead, as the psalmist and Isaiah, the prophets all say, our God is a living God who spoke the world into existence, who is above and beyond all things, who delivered the children of Israel from nations more powerful from them on every side, who delivered David from enemies that surrounded him and would overthrow him, a God that is more powerful. He's a living God. That is our hope. And you have a hope that will not fade away. And that's what we want to give praise and thanks to God for. And it's all because of what Christ has done on the cross in our behalf. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I pray you'll help us as your children to look to Christ, our head, our Lord, our master, who Paul lifted up in Ephesians chapter 4, saying he is the head, he is the Lord, he is the master. And all parts of the body look to him as our head. Lord, may we all look to Christ as our Savior recognizing our hope is in him. Father, we praise you and thank you for the salvation we have, for the living hope that we have because of what Christ has done and for our salvation. Lord, I pray for all that could be listening to the recording as potential pastors or young pastors. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage each one and me to apply and give ourselves diligently to rightly dividing, preaching, teaching your word, and to living lives that are exemplary. We need your grace because we're fallen creatures and we, we desperately need your enablement, your grace, your Holy Spirit to help and direct our steps. 
We pray, Father, for brothers that have fallen, for those that are not where they ought to be right now. But Father, we also pray for all of us as your children, not just pastors, but may each of us apply ourselves to godliness, to look into Christ as our head, our Lord, our master. And we ask that you would conform us to his image as you tell us this is your will. And we're thankful that this is alive, a living hope and something that was going to last. We thank you, Father, that as we apply ourselves to these things, we have hope not just for this world, but also for that one to come. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death on the cross we will celebrate momentarily. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.